My message this morning is something that um, has been a blessing to me as I went through this to prepare it. Uh, what are you worth? And um, I imagine, in, have you, imagine in our, each of our lives, we've often asked the question, am I worth anything? Am I wretched, like Amazing Grace says, and, and are we in need of something? I feel we really need something, we need God. But uh, sometimes we get to the point that we say, I'm just not worth anything. Why do all this? Why be a Christian? You know? And of course the devil's inspiring that. So, um, but have you ever thought about what you're worth? What do you mean to God? You know, we're one in, I don't know how many people have lived on the earth and will live on the earth before Jesus comes. Trillions of people? I don't, I'm just guessing. But are, are we worth anything to God being one of a trillion people? And um, so I really think that we ought to think about this. Uh, what, is, what are we worth to God? What are we worth? A few years ago, in Venezuela, a father paid $900,000 to ransom his 13-year-old son who had been kidnapped. That's a lot of money. I know I couldn't afford it. But uh, he was willing to pay this. He had the money, and he paid $900,000. Now, the question comes to mind, was his son worth $900,000? How many say yes? Come on. Oh, dear. Some say no. Some don't have any idea. Thought. Okay. All right. I thought all the hands would go up. If you had a son or a daughter that was kidnapped, wouldn't you pay $900,000 to get them back if you knew we were going to get them back? Of course you would. What's that? More. More. Okay. More. M mucho más. Yeah. Much more. Has anyone paid a ransom for you? Huh? All right, okay. Of course it has. And Jesus sacrificed his life for you. He's paid a ransom for you on Calvary. He did it because he loves you. Individually, he did it because he wants to spend eternity with you individually. I really believe that. Uh, in Revelation 21, 3, it tells us that God is, we're going to be uh, part of his inhabitation, his people. His, uh, he's going to dwell with us. And he's uh, going to, throughout eternity. And you know, back at the end, beginning, before this world was, three, one third of the angels left heaven with Satan. So he wants to repopulate heaven with us, I believe. I think it's more important than that. Because we were created by God, He loves us, He cares for us, and individually, when He went to the cross, He saw you, me, and everyone in this congregation here this morning. Individually speaking, you are worth it. Some may say yes, and some may say no, you know, but uh, I, and I, I run into this out of the jail. I have a ministry out of the jail. It was curtailed about three months ago. But a lot of the guys out there, I talk to only the guys, and some of them have a very low feel, uh, impression of God because God doesn't care anything about me because otherwise I wouldn't be here where I am now. And uh, they've been raised that way. They don't have any um, knowledge of God. Very, there's a few out there that uh, were raised Christians. In fact, there's more than a few. But the reason they're, the reason they're out there, they made a stupid mistake. And it's cost them uh, jail time. But they're very intelligent people. They love the Lord. And I enjoy talking to them. But also I'm enjoy, I enjoy talking to people who don't have a good uh, self-image of themselves. And uh, I try to share with them about God's love for them individually, themselves. Now, for those who say they're not worth the sacrifice, I have a question for you. Does God know no values? Does the one who made you know what you're worth? Think about it. He's our creator. We're just not here on the planet just to 
uh, something uh, from outer space somewhere. God created us. The thought, thought, this thought I would like to share with you. If you are not worth what he paid for you, then God cheated himself, didn't he? Jesus went to the cross for us. And he, if he didn't have to do that, he cheated himself. Why go through all that just to save people? But we are very important to him, very special to him. He, did he pay too much? Thank God you are all, we are all worth the ransom that Jesus paid on the cross for us. Let's suppose that when his father, this father, this man who uh, is Venezuelan, his father paid the $900,000, was approached by someone else uh, about this ransom, this uh, ransom he paid for his son. And he says to this, this Venezuelan, he says, Sir, I hear that you're looking for your boy and will pay $900,000 ransom. Yes, can you help me find him? He says, I got a better deal. I got a better deal for you. Think of this. If you can't get your boy, well, I think I can get your boy if you pay me. It'll only cost you $1,000. I can save you a lot of money. In fact, I can save you. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I can save you a lot of money. In fact, if you will give me $1,000, I'll see that you get your boy and you'll save $899,000. Would the father shown an interest in that, do you think? Huh? Okay. I believe the answer to that question is an absolute no. He was not looking for a boy but he was looking for his own boy. He would have paid the price. He would have paid the price. Why did God pay such an infinite price for man? To understand this, we may under, must understand why God created him. God created man for fellowship with himself. Concerning Israel of old, Thank you, Paul. It worked. I'm not used to using this. Okay? In Isaiah 43, 21, the prophet says, This people I have formed for myself. This is God speaking. This people I have formed my myself for myself. They shall declare my praise. And Psalm 149.4, the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Friends, brothers and sisters here this morning, you are unique. Each one of you individually. God needed only one like you. We're all different. In, um, the, uh, in a statement made in Science of the Times at the turn of the century, it says, we were bought, brought into existence because we're needed. Did you ever think of that? God needs us? You see, the whole plan of salvation isn't just God came down here and died on the cross so we could have something to do. He had you in mind, each one of us in mind. And uh, he brought us into existence because we're needed. One of the greatest needs in the human heart is to feel needed. To fill that need of, need of the one we love, we know that we, the one fill, fills, that, that one fills our need, that constitutes the basis of true fellowship. When we know, when we, know we, we love someone, we love people, but it's nice to know that they love us. They appreciate that love. And we need to appreciate God's love for us. Through all human relationships, God seeks to reveal himself to us. He longs to have us understand not only what he means to us, but what we mean to him. Many biblical heroes, heroes made God glad by enjoying fellowship with him. 
We're told that Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and then God took him. That's in Genesis 5.23. Enoch meant so much to the Lord that the Lord, that the Lord said to him, Come home with me, Enoch. We'll keep walking together through all eternity. And I think God wants to say that to each one of us here today. Come along with me, Skip. Come along with me, uh, Don. God wants to walk with you throughout eternity. It's a love relationship. Before his translation, Enoch had, was translated to heaven. Enoch had this testimony, and that's found in Hebrews 5, 11, 5, that he pleased God. There was a loving relationship between them. God made, Enoch, excuse me, Enoch made God happy because Enoch loved God. And you know, we're told in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, this is interesting, that there are Enoch's walking on this earth today. Okay? People that have that close, loving relationship with God, a genuine relationship with God, they are walking close to God. That's, a, that's an interesting. But it gives you hope, doesn't it? That you can become one of those Enoch's. Enoch met the heart, the heart need of the infinite one, that is God. Think of Abraham. The scriptures do record his mistakes and failures, but it also states Okay. It also states that in James 2.23 that he was called a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God, even though he made mistakes. He even made some serious mistakes, but he was called a friend of God. Who called Abraham that? The Lord himself. That's where I want to be right now. But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Let's consider Moses for a minute. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And that's found in Exodus. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord as God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, you, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? This friendship developed during Moses' years of solitude as a shepherd in Midian and continued throughout his 40 years as visible leader of Israel. Remember, Moses in the mount shut in with God here in the closest communion when he was in the mount with the God. Here the Lord reveals to Moses the plans for a sanctuary on earth, a minister model of the heavenly temple. And if you read in Exodus 25 to 40, which we're not going to do this morning, you'll find out how he established the sanctuary and how God led him to establish the sanctuary. In John, the 15th chapter, I don't have this scripture on the board here, but in John 15, 14 and 15, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for the things I heard from my Father I have made known to you. So Jesus is our friend. He calls us his friends. You know, there's a special relationship going here. It's not just a, a relationship. It's a friendship relationship, a lovely relationship, a relationship that's the genuine. In revealing these plans to Moses on the mount, uh, God interrupts Moses in his telling of these things, and he's telling what's going on down in the camp. You remember he was up on the mount, and uh, things were going on in the camp. The apostasy in the camp uh, discerned, d d demands stern measures. God proposes to wipe out Israel and begin a new nation with Moses. And like Abraham, Moses dares humbly but boldly to intercede with God. And we find this in Exodus 32, uh, verses 11. Okay, then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought me 
them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, to consume them in the face of the earth. Turn your fierce, fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, all the land that I have spoken to you of, of, I give to your descendants, and they shall inherit forever. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the, pe the, to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed great sin and have made themselves a gold, God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. You know, in a way, this is what Moses was like Christ. He was willing to be blotted out of the book of life that he might save his people. And Jesus was willing to come to this earth and die that we might have eternal life. He was willing to do that. And um, I just think it's so beautiful when we think that um, Moses was in this a type of Christ there. He was willing to give up eternal life that he might, his people might be saved. I believe that Moses' pleas echoed the deepest yearnings of God he loved. So God and Moses come to united understanding and agreement as concerned towards Israel's future. Where do you fit into this picture? God has formed you too to be his friend. You cannot take the place of Enoch or Abraham or Moses, but God has a place in his infinite heart that only you can fill. God needs you for his friend. You know, I had a hard time with that because <laughs> I'm just one of trillions of people, millions of people. And why does God need me as a friend? But he looks at me as special because I'm a special creation. I was a, and uh, to st study that, and think about it, it boggles your mind somewhat that God thinks of me as wanting to be my friend. His friend, you cannot take the place of Moses and Abraham, as I said. He longs for our fellowship, our love, and our understanding. To him, you are very precious. For this reason, he made you. For this reason, he died for you. For this reason, he went back to heaven to repair a place for you. In John 14, 3, Jesus says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now he's talking on an individual basis. He's not talking about collective Israel. He's talking about you and me. He wants to spend eternity with us. So beautiful. So wonderful. God we serve. God values you, values you as if you were the only one in the world. In the book, a little book, Steps to Christ, on page 100, it says, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth. I'll read that again. The relations, the relations between God and each soul, between you and, I, uh, you and God, are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth. You're very special to him. I'm special to him. There's only one thing that hinders our loving relationship with God. Sin, we're told, is sin separated man from God in Eden. Sin prolongs that separation today. Now, when we talk about sin separating us from God, we're not talking about the sinful nature. That's something we can't do anything about, our sinful nature. <coughs> Excuse me. But he's talking about willful sin. Isaiah 59, 2. Okay, I didn't have that one on. Okay. As I said, I don't know how to use this very well. Okay. 
Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Since sin makes a separation between God and that he loves, and God and those he loves, God hates sin. He cannot tolerate it. He cannot live with it. He loves the sinner, but hates the sin. That's why he wants to get rid of sin in our lives. God must eradicate sin, but how can he do it without destroying those infected with sin? He could come down and go, you're all done. You've sinned, I'm going, you're done with, you're destroyed. No, he doesn't want to do that. Um, this is, in the sanctuary that God provided for his people, he reveals his wonderful plan to solve the sin problem. He's, he um, provides a plan on how to destroy sin without destroying those he loves and how to save sinners without perpetuating sin. It's an expensive plan. It has already cost heaven long ages of sorrow and pain. But you are so valuable to Christ. You, but you are also, are also so valuable to Christ that he would have paid the entire ransom just to save you alone. Now, there's something I was reading the other night in Desire of Ages. Anything, if you have that book, read it, please. It's beautiful. On page 131, it says something, and I don't know if you ever read this before, but in three, actually in three places, the Tsar of Ages says that Jesus took a risk in coming to this earth and dying for us, and living for us and dying. He took a risk. And she elaborates on this in, a different, in another place, that he could have lost the battle with evil. Now, you say, well, why is that true? How can you prove that? Why was Satan after Jesus all through his life? He wanted to trip him up because he knew if he tripped him up, Satan would become the ruler. He was after Jesus, and he knew that if he could get Jesus to sin just once, that would be the end of the plan of salvation. Praise God it never happened. Amen? 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 And there's another statement in Desire of Ages I like. It's on 417. It says, Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. Get that? Beautiful. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He was willing to come here because we're lost. I thank God for that. Christ not only provided a ransom, but he also made it possible for us to be with him someday. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. He's our intercessor. He's our savior. And he's our friend. Sin is the problem. The solution is in the sanctuary. Why is sin such a great problem? Well, it's the root cause of all other problems in, we see in this world. There's war, there's no peace, crime, broken homes, disease, pandemics, strife, guilt feelings, all kinds of things. Sin is man's greatest problem. It is also God's great problem too. He longs to have a happy fellowship with us. Since sin has made separation, sin must be removed for the, se for the separation to end. Why not burn sin up? Sooner, sooner the better. God would like to destroy it at once, but look at his problem. Many of those he loves are infected with this deadly virus. He can't translate us to heaven with sin in our lives. The only solution which can satisfy God's heart of infinite love must separate sin from sinners. Can this be done? God says it can. Satan says it's impossible. Whom do you believe? Only God can solve the sin problem, and he's done that through his son, Jesus. Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am Lord, the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Jesus is our Savior. He's going to save us from our sins. 2 Corinthians now all things are of God who has reconciled him to us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to him, and he has committed us the word of reconciliation. 
not imputing their trespasses. In other words, he's taken our sin upon himself and given us salvation, his righteousness. What an exchange. Don't we have a wonderful Savior, a wonderful friend? Oh, wow. I like that word, wow. You know, I, I don't know if that's appropriate, but that's the way I, what I felt like saying, wow. In 1 John 3, 5, And you know that he was a manifest to take away our sins, and in him there's no sin. In the sanctuary, this is portrayed through the sanctuary service. I won't go into that this morning because that's a long topic, but... Um, in the sanctuary, the plan of salvation is, is shown to us. It's a, a model of the of this plan of salvation. The center of the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation, is God's temple in heaven. Um, Jeremiah seventeen twelve. Okay, let's go back. Jeremiah seventeen twelve says, "A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary." Jeremiah seven twelve seventeen twelve. The Lord is, Psalm 11, 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. The Lord has enlisted the angels of heaven to help solve this, the problem, sin problem. Hebrews 1, 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Brothers and sisters, the sin problem has been solved in each of our lives through Jesus Christ, our wonderful Savior. He redeemed. He's our redeemer. He's our friend. Jesus took our sin, gave us his righteousness, and now we're saved through him, through the wonderful love of Jesus. To that temple, to the temple, God's people have turned their eyes, poured out their prayers and hope. David sings, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your holy name for your loving kindness and your truth. Psalm 30, 138, 2 and 3. In, um, in Psalm 18, 6, In my distress I call upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and cry came before him, even to his ears. Psalms 18, 6. God desires that we shall become, a well, become well acquainted with the work going on in the heavenly sanctuary. The most visual, marvelous visual aid of the ages was prepared, in this, that is the sanctuary, in order that we might become acquainted with God's heavenly sanctuary and his plan of salvation. Yes, what are you worth? Infinite, an infinite price has been paid for you. He is your friend. He's paid that price, and he loves you. In closing this morning, I want to read something I just discovered last night. It's a little book called Steps of Christ. You ever heard of it? <coughs> it's the last two paragraphs in the book itself. The, the chapter is called Rejoicing in the Lord. Now I'm going back another paragraph. Then the redeemed, now this is the redeemed that reached the heavenly kingdom. God has paid the price and he has given us eternal life and we are the redeemed in heaven. Then the redeemed will wel be welcomed into the home that Jesus is preparing for them. There, their companions will not be the vile of the earth, liars, idolaters, the impure and unbelieving, but they will associate with those who have overcome Satan and through divine grace have formed perfect characters. Every sinful tendency, every imperfection that afflicts them on earth has been removed by the blood of Christ and excellence in the brightness of his glory, far exceeding the brightness of the sun, is imparted to them. And the moral beauty, the perfection of his character, shines through them in worth far more exceeding than his outward splendor. They are without fault before the great white throne, sharing the dignity and privileges of angels. Doesn't God think something of us? Of course. He said, we are before the great white throne, sharing the dignity and privileges of angels. In view of the glorious inheritance that may be his, what shall man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew 16, 26. He may be poor. 
He may possess in himself a wealth and dignity that the world could never bestow. The soul redeemed and cleansed from sin, with all its noble powers dedicated to the service of God, is of surpassing worth, and there is a joy in heaven in the presence of God and the holy angels over one soul redeemed, a joy that is expressed in songs in heaven of holy triumph. Wow. Well, that's the end of my, my message this morning, but um, I hope it was a blessing. But uh, I know it was a blessing in going and preparing this because I sometimes wonder, am I worth it? You all have had that experience, but you are. Jesus paid an infinite price for our salvation. He took a risk when he came to this earth. And if there's only one person need to be saved, he would have left heaven to do that. We're, we're worth it. We're worth it to God. And uh, he loves us. And uh, he cares for us. And I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus comes, when we spend eternity with him in that earth made new. I mean, this is so I want to read. We've got time here. One little part here. I, I, I referred to it a while ago. But Revelation 21. You know, when I was, I'll tell you something else. When I was canvassing, I was a literature evangelist for a while, then I was spent most of my time in leadership. Was a pastor for a while too. But um, whenever I was, when I was out canvassing with uh, other people, teaching them how to sell books and leave the message in the home, I sometimes come home just kind of discouraged. You know, is this all worth all this, you know? Getting door slammed in your face once in a while. Not often, but once in a while. And you know what I do? I'll, I'll suggest this to you. Um, go home and read the last chapter in The Great Controversy. I read that, and all of a sudden I felt, ah, I know why I'm here, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And God has called me to a special work. I wish I had The Great Controversy with me. I'd read it to you, but... It's getting too long. It's going to be too long to read it. The last chapter in the great controversy, the last chapter in Steps to Christ, is a beautiful chapter too. Rejoicing in the Lord, realizing what he has done for us and the plan that he has for our lives. Now, the scripture I was going to read is uh, uh, Revelation 21, 2. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and women. Now, they're individual. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Yes, we are very special to God. The ransom he paid, it was well worth it. And uh, I'm so thankful that he did pay that price because this uh, gives me an opportunity. Well, more than that, it's a gift. God gives, has given us a gift, and that is salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And if we accept that gift, we'll have eternity. All we have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll be saved. The Bible tells us that. And then he works in our lives to change us. Oh, well. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the salvation that you've given us through your son Jesus 2,000 years ago. We thank you for wanting us to be your friend. And we're thankful that you, we are your friends. Every one of us here this morning is a friend of God. That's special. And I thank you for that special uh, calling that you've called us to be your people in these last days, to reveal to others the wonderful love of God and the wonderful love of Jesus, and that they are special in God's sight. Bless us now. Keep us in your loving care. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.